Hello, adventuresses, and welcome to the show for women who love horses, travel, and adventure. Today, I'm talking with Adrian, and she's American, and she wound up in South Africa, and she shares with us a lot of her stories and experiences in South Africa, and just her love, her love of the place, and, you know, how she just kept going back and back and again and again. She shares with us an experience where she actually got robbed in South Africa, and that didn't uh, turn her way. And she also, she went recently to Mozambique, and she enjoyed a horse riding adventure there. So she shares with us um, some really interesting stories. So you're not going to want to miss this. Before we get started, I just wanted to make one quick announcement, and that is for you to check out our discounts tier on our Patreon. I really wanted a special way of thanking the members of the Equestrian Adventuresses community for, you know, listening to our podcast and watching our YouTube videos and talking with each other on the Facebook group. And so I felt like my my way of saying thank you was to arrange for you these these really cool discounts and all of these really fabulous horse riding destinations around the world and we're you know going to be adding more and more discounts to the list every month and you'll also find other discounts available like for our online courses and you know lots of things because you know I really and truly I just wanted to say thank you guys for for listening and for for everything that you're doing supporting this channel so basically you just go to equestrianadventuresses.com and you will see the premium members button you click on that and you can sign up for our discounts tier. It's $15 a month only, and you would be getting discounts from all kinds of horse riding destinations. We have South Africa is also on there. So, you know, if you love this podcast and you want to go riding in South Africa and you want to save some money while doing it, just go in, join our tier, and you will get uh, access to various horse riding destinations. We have um, South Africa, we have Mongolia, we have Greece, we have New Zealand, and you could be saving $200, $300, uh, 15% if you invite a friend. You know, we have lots of crazy discounts on there. So, you know, the amount of money that you're going to be saving is just ridiculous. And that's just on one trip. So, you're welcome. And cue the music. We are explorers. We are trailblazers. We love to do what cannot be done. We love to test our limits cross borders, and we love the freedom horses bring us. We seek lands without fences. Who are we? We are equestrian adventuresses. We are a community of women who love horses, travel, and adventure. To infinity and beyond! And now your host, Crystal Kelly! Hello, adventuresses. I am talking today with Adrienne. She is actually from Colorado, so she's sitting in Colorado. I'm here in England, and hello. Hello. So you have an interesting life. You had contacted me um, not too long ago, and I was like, okay, you have to come on the podcast because um, you know you just have this really interesting life. Um, but before <laughs> before we really get into that, I kind of want to step back and get into the beginning. So. You know, how did you, what's your background with horses? How did you get into it? And then what made you start traveling with horses? Sure. Um, well, I grew up in Colorado and my neighbors had horses. And so I started riding with them when I was pretty little and did 4-H and rodeo and all of that good stuff. Um, a lot of Western riding. Got into more English riding and competing when I was in high school. I uh, was on the collegiate equestrian team through college and things like that. And then... Um, and had grown up traveling a lot with my family. And so I had that travel bug from an early age, but it was always very separate from the horses. And then all through, well, in high school, I started teaching riding lessons to some of the younger kids at my stable. And then through high school and college, I actually put myself through school um, teaching riding lessons and training horses. And then when I graduated, I have a degree in international relations, which I'm not using for much these days, um, but graduated and was really enjoying what I was doing with the horses. And so I kept doing that. But every winter, you know, the winters can be a bit brutal in Colorado, especially around January, February. And every winter I would try to take a trip somewhere just to do something different. And sometimes it was riding and sometimes it wasn't, but I was going to a lot of really cool places and getting to do some different things. Um, I did actually spend a couple years in there after college and before coming back to Colorado just traveling and riding. I lived in Brazil for a while and France and Argentina, all working with horses. Um, and so when I came back to Colorado, I would take these breaks in the winter to go travel and ride. And every year I would come back and I had friends and clients who said, you know, I want to go to these places that you're going and do these things you're doing, but I don't know, 
I don't know where to start or I don't want to go by myself or I don't know how to set this up. And so I started planning some of these trips for people um, and started a company called Equiscapes Equestrian Adventures, which I run a couple of years. I've run for a couple of years now. We do a couple of trips a year to different places. Um, but my primary focus at the moment is South Africa and the rest of Southern Africa. Okay. You just covered a whole lot of stuff in two and a half minutes. Um, so yep. podcast is now done and good night. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay. So you, you said, you know, your parents were sort of traveling with you. Uh, you know, was this international mm -hmm. travel or was this mostly domestic or? Yeah, we, um, my mom wanted us to learn another language. When I was about seven, we moved to France. Um, my dad was working kind of remotely and traveling a lot for work, so he could be based just about anywhere, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. So we would spend part of the year in France and part of the year here, and we did that for about eight years. Oh, wow. um, and so I think that instilled in me this, this constant, you know, always getting ready for the next trip, wondering where you're going to go next kind of thing, which is funny because in my brother, he had it had the opposite effect. He's a lot more of a homebody now. I think he got so tired of the traveling that now it's a lot harder to get him to go and travel. Um, but, um, yeah, that was what kind of got me started traveling yeah, and then travel that's, um... when I quit in college. And then, like I said, after, after I finished college, I sold my horses and spent a couple of years traveling before coming back to Colorado. Wow. So, I mean, you know, I grew up in a small town in California and most of the people that I went to high school with, I'm just going to say it, they've never left the same town that I grew up in. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of Americans don't really travel internationally. I mean, some yeah. of them don't even leave their own their own town or their own state. You know, so here you are, seven years mm -hmm. old, and your parents are trapezing you around the world. Um, did you have a hard time relating with your, I don't know, your the kids in your school? Or was it just sort of normal for you? Or? Well, there was this kind of funny, you know, caught between two cultures. At first, when I got to France, I mean, I was pretty terrified to start school. I didn't speak French. I knew how to say, come here immediately and put on your hat. <laughs> and that was that was my French. Those are not useful phrases to use on other first graders. Um, sounds very French and, woman to me. <laughs> but you know, kids, are, kids are very resilient, and they they pick things up really quickly. And within a month, you know, we were speaking French fluently and making friends. Um, and so on that side, that was never really a problem. But then when I'd come back here, um, you know, I was this kid who who would disappear for half the year, and so kids didn't really know what to do with that. And I remember coming back and having to explain to kids that no, I'm not French. I just go live there sometimes, but um, but in elementary school I became like the French kid that was that was what the other kids knew me by. Um, so it was a little bit confusing, but I don't know. We made it work. And so, how old were you when you started your um, solo travels? You know, when you started working with horses. You said Argentina and a, and a few places. So how old were you? Do you think? Um, well, those are kind of two separate. Separate questions. So I started my solo travels when I was in college. I wanted to go back to France and visit where I had grown up. And so I did my first solo trip in Europe when I was about 19. Um, I spent the summer or half of the summer traveling and went back to France and then went to a few other places by myself and then did a bit more of that through college, but wasn't doing that and riding. And then I spent my last semester of college studying abroad in Brazil and um, wrote my thesis doing research on tourism in a very small town um, where I ended up staying on and lived there for almost a year and was guiding trail rides there. Um, so that was kind of unrelated. And then moved from there to Argentina and was working with horses there. So what was that like when you started working abroad with horses, um, especially uh, Argentina and, you know, you're a, a young lady and I, I think maybe the stereotype is that in Argentina, it's a lot of gauchos, it's a lot of men, you know, so so what was that mm -hmm. like for you? Um, well, in Brazil, when I had been doing my research, I actually hadn't been riding at all, and I didn't realize how much I missed it until I found that again, and then kind of had this epiphany of, you know, I can't, I can't do that again. I can't take this out of, out of my life. This is something that's far too important to me. Um, and, and so that was really cool to be able to get back in that and, and realize how much, how much of a hold it had on my heart and had always had. Um, and then I actually moved to Argentina with a guy. And so, and he was working with horses as well. He was a polo player. And so as far as kind of the traditional machismo roles, I think that helped with that a bit in the sense that I already had an in there. Um, you know, I was training horses with him. And so, 
Um, you know, I didn't really have to worry about, I didn't have to make any of my own connections. I didn't have to set anything up. I just, uh, we were riding horses and teaching yoga and it was just horses and yoga and horses and yoga every day, but he was handling all the logistics, which now looking back, I'd love to go back to Argentina and do it a little bit differently because I never did really get to explore Argentina on my own. I mean, we were so attached at the hip and we did everything together, um, which ultimately was why I left Argentina, but, um, it would be really cool now now that I'm older to go back and revisit that and uh and do it a little differently and see another side of of the country and did he convince you to try polo no I had actually um I was on the equestrian team in college and we had tried to start a polo team and a local polo club that we had worked with while we were trying to do that ultimately we never got it past risk management at the university but um but that was how I got into polo and then I met him through polo in Colorado so I had played a little bit. I'm not very good. Um, you know, now 10 years later, still not very good. But um, but just just really enjoyed it and met some really cool people. Um, and then then when I was in Brazil, he was like, well, I'm you know heading down to Argentina to see my family and spend some time there. And you're already on the continent. So why don't you hop on over here and come hang out for a while? So perfect. And then where did you go after Argentina? Um, and after Argentina, I went to France and was actually training barrel racing horses there, which at the time was not even something I knew they did in France. <laughs> um, found this online job posting and took this job kind of sight unseen. I'd always wanted to get back to France. And, you know, it's always been kind of my home away from home and, um, and, and showed up for this job. But the job description had been, um, you know, managing this training and, um, and show facility for Western riding and working with clients, teaching lessons, competing, all that sort of thing. And I showed up and it was this older gentleman who had bought a piece of land to build this facility, but hadn't yet actually even broken ground. And in the meantime, you know, had a handful of Western horses at his house, all these imported horses from Texas with names from Western movies like Pistol and Dynamite and Peppy, you know. Um, and and of the horses, I mean, two two were very, very young. One was very pregnant. One was pretty lame so there were only three or four that I was actually riding um and it was it just wasn't enough to keep me busy so I was there for a couple of months doing that and then um kind of decided I was ready to move on to the next thing but stayed in France for a while and traveled around Europe for a bit from there got to ride in some other places around Europe um and then eventually came back to the U.S. after that like you said I also don't really think of barrel racing when I think of France so you know you start yeah, traveling and it's it's growing there really quickly and people are breeding quarter horses and <laughs> importing horses from the u.s i actually the stallion at that ranch was out of a stallion in texas whom years later back in colorado i got i, I randomly was given a horse by a client and when i looked at his papers he was out of the same stallion as that <laughs> that one that i rode in france wow small world <laughs> yeah so, uh, you know, one of the things that I think caught my attention when you had sent me a, an email was, um, you know, Crystal, I've, and I'm probably not going to quote you exactly, but, you know, you know, you said, like, I've been around the world and I didn't really, uh, when I came to South Africa, I sort of found everything that I, that I needed. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you're bouncing around, you're, you're seeing the world. Tell, tell me about your, your first time to South Africa. Um, well, how I ended up in South Africa was kind of a funny, random thing. Um, I actually, through somebody that I fox hunted with here in Colorado, um, she and I, we were both in college and were riding young horses for people out at the hunt here. And then she got offered a fellowship as part of a PhD program to go study in Cape Town and invited me to come visit. And South Africa had always been one of those faraway places that's, you know, on the list, but you don't have a concrete plan of how to get there because of well, it's really far. Um, and so having that jumping off point seemed like a great way to go and do that. But it was also really far for me to go and just, you know, visit her for a week and come back. So I booked a trip for three months and then reached out um, through several different sites and resources to try to find somewhere to volunteer or get a, a job or an internship or something. Um, so some of them were horse related, some were hospitality related, some were, you know, wildlife sanctuaries and things like that. Showed up in South Africa, hadn't heard back from any of them. 
so I didn't really have a plan. And and was hanging out with this friend and got this email from this woman that was like, yeah, we'd love to have you. We've got a couple of horses. Take the bus from Cape Town to this town on this day, and we'll pick you up in a red truck. And um, and my friends were laughing because they were like, this sounds like the sketchiest thing ever, and I can't believe you're actually going to do this. And and her name was Cornelia, and I remember one of my friends, South African friends, saying, you know, she's probably this like old Afrikaans lady with a bunch of cats, and you're going to learn to knit or something. Um, And just had no idea what I was getting into, but went for it and got on a bus and got off at this tiny little town and was waiting at this truck stop. And she was late and I was really nervous because it was starting to get dark and I didn't know who this person was. I didn't have a phone or anything. And then this little red truck shows up and uh, and she was a few years older than I was. I think I was 25, 26 at that time, 25. And she was in her early 30s. And just this hippie with like, like no shoes and a sundress and feathers in her hair. Um, and she and her her now husband came and picked me up. And um, and it was just the perfect fit. I mean, from the get go, we just we had a lot of fun. There was another girl volunteering there as well who was from Germany. And the four of us just were this little family um, where we she was doing guided rides on the beach and through the sand dunes and kind of the local nature conservation area. And so we would help her with that but then we also so she really took the time when we weren't working to take us around the garden root area and you know everything she and her boyfriend went and did we went and did so if they were going to a party with some friends or going to dinner or going to spend a weekend camping somewhere going to a music festival we just went and did all of that with them and met really cool people and um got to do a lot of really cool things and see some wonderful places and so that was what made me fall in love with south africa um to the point where where I kept wanting to go back every year and visit. And that was when, you know, friends back here kept saying, well, I want to go and do that too. Um, And so, so we started to do that. Um, But what I mean about South Africa, having everything I needed is with, with the different kinds of riding that I had been doing in different places, almost everything I could do anywhere else I could do in South Africa. So in South Africa, you know, you can ride on the beach, you can ride in the mountains, you can go camping with horses, you can play polo, you can fox hunt, you can ride Western, You can ride on safari, you can ride through the winelands. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, And so it was really cool to be able to put together trips that incorporated a lot of those different things um, and be able to work with a lot of different kinds of riders in really different settings and really different, very beautiful landscapes. And when you said, you know, you first contacted her and it sounded a little bit sketchy, but you, you know, you Mm -hmm. still got on the plane and you still went for it. What does that feel like? You know, I've also had moments where I've literally had people tell me, you know, don't go, you're you're going to die or you're going to, you know, they they watch the news and they get scared by whatever it is that they saw. And, um, you know, how did you feel when you got on the plane? Were you a bit nervous or at that point were you just sort of, you know, super experienced and you're like, yeah, it'll be fine? Or... Um, I don't really get nervous about traveling until it's it's too late for me to maybe have a better plan. So, I mean, I went to South Africa kind of knowing I didn't have that much of a plan, but being like, well, it's okay, I'll figure it out when I get there. And then I got on this bus to go out to Muscle Bay, and I remember thinking, like, well, if it falls through, you know, I'll just go back to Cape Town and make a new plan. And I will have wasted my time, but, you know, at least I do have that option. So I did have kind of a fallback plan. Um, And then ultimately, you know, I had planned to maybe volunteer one place for a month and then somewhere else for a month and then somewhere else for a month and ended up spending the whole three months months at the same place um, and have since gone back almost every year to and, see them. But we did meet some other, so she had a friend who also had a similar like trail, trail operation. Um, and so some of her volunteers came and rode with us at one point um, and we went and rode with them. They were doing some, something similar in the mountains to what we were doing on the beaches. And I remember them telling us about how, you know, they worked really, really hard. This woman had multiple rides going out every day. And then in the evenings her volunteers, were expected to help take care of her kids um, and help in the family restaurant and all this kind of thing. And so they weren't really, you know, part of the family the way we were. And so having that that connection really, really made that volunteer experience. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I, I started out sort of the same. I started out working abroad at different stables with horses. And, you know, I felt like I saw the country not quite like a local, but as close to a local as you can be. And I, I, yeah. it's hard and not it to fall in love. So, so, 
Yeah, I mean, I think those volunteer experiences or even working are, are so different in every in every situation in terms of how much of it you spend working and how much of it you spend connecting with the people and the place and the experience and getting to do really unique things. And so before South Africa, um, had you felt like you were looking for a place to call home? Did you feel a little bit restless? Uh, did you think you were going to be a nomad forever? Or, you know, what was your mental state I, before then? I wasn't necessarily looking for a different home, but I was feeling quite restless. Um, at that time, I was riding, I was teaching at a riding school and riding for a very competitive stable in Colorado. And was just getting really burned out, um, you know, going to the same horse shows every summer and April to September, 5, 5 a.m. mornings every weekend, and um, just doing the same things with the same kids. And And the stable that I was at was, was doing some things that I disagreed with. I felt like the lesson horses were overworked and we were selling some horses that weren't entirely sound and things like that that I just didn't want to be a part of and didn't want to be associated with. And so I was kind of looking for an out. But at that point, you know, I had worked with horses for so long that I didn't feel like I could fall back and try to use my degree for something. I mean, I had no experience in that, that realm, whereas the horses was, you know, this is what I had been doing. And so I was trying to kind of figure out how I could still put my passion for horses to work, but not be caught up in the show world, which I wasn't enjoying. Um, and actually, at the end of that first trip, I had a really bad riding accident, my very last week there that put me in the hospital and some surgeries, things like that. And, um, and so that kind of actually gave me an opportunity when I came back to, to take a step away. Um, you know, the riding school, it didn't look very good for me to be teaching riding lessons with all these injuries that I had gotten while riding, you know, parents tend not to, not to love that. Um, uh, and so that, that kind of gave me an opportunity to take a step back and reevaluate. And then, and I already knew at that point I wanted to go back to South Africa, like South Africa had taken hold old and and I knew I couldn't couldn't get away from that um and so that was when I started thinking well how could I combine horses and traveling instead of horses and competing or horses and teaching full-time kind of thing um and so that was when I started my travel company as a way to continue riding and continue to share my passion but also be able to travel and continue to spend time in South Africa and explore some new places on horseback as well so how does that work? So in South Africa, you you want to start your own uh, business. So you know you're American. Do you have any? Have you ever had a business before? Do you kind of ask around, or how how does that even begin? Yeah, I mean, I had run a couple startups before with like my writing lesson program and things like that. Um, I'm an artist as well, and so I have a company that markets and sells my artwork. And so I did have some experience with the business side of things as far as setting up the business in South Africa that part is very complicated so my business is technically based in the US so just like any other tour operator that's an American company that leads trips to a lot of other places the business side is is housed here in the US um, and then I looked around at some other companies and at what they were doing and obviously there's a lot of you know riding safari places where you book in at a lodge and you can go and spend a week um, and there's a lot of travel agencies where you know they'll set up for you to go and do that at a specific place, whether it's in South Africa or somewhere else. And so what I found was lacking is that a lot of Americans especially are very hesitant to travel to certain places because they feel like they're dangerous and so they don't want to go by themselves. And so being able to put together trips where, you know, you, you, you're with a guide who's taking you from place to place to place and you get to combine these different kinds of riding. So it's not just going and riding on safari, it's going and riding on safari, but then also getting to see Cape Town and also getting to do this and this and this, A, B, and C kind of thing. Um, and then some of my riders who didn't want to go by themselves and were kind of timid riders liked the idea that all the trips are guided by someone who's also an instructor. And so throughout the trip, you're also building your riding skills on lots of different horses that you can then come home and apply to your horses back here as well. And so um, in that sense, I felt like the trips applied a lot more to solo riders and timid riders who won't wanted to go on a trip like this, but either didn't have anyone to go with or didn't want to go by themselves. And that was kind of how, how we got our start. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I had a lot of experiences, especially when I was living in India. Um, and I, I realized I had all the connections. I knew where was safe, where to eat. 
um, I knew so much from personal experience that I actually started also sort of taking um, some people around. And at, at the time, I think I was 22 or something. It hadn't quite occurred to me. I was working full time with horses, but I, I hadn't um, associated tourism with horses at that point in my life. So I never put two and two together. Yeah. So I would do my horsey thing during during the week, and then I would like take tourists around on the weekend or something. Um, but I do yeah. remember, you know, how much it. Um, it was just nice for them to sort of have me with them because I knew everything mm-hmm. and I knew it from their point of view. Um, so, you know, when you when you started taking people around or or you started um, your business, you know, what was what was the first few groups like? What was the first trip that you did? You know, did you how, how did it go? Um, the very first trip that I did was actually a woman I had taught lessons to in Colorado who had just gotten divorced and just really needed to go somewhere else and take her mind off of things. And I was trying to put together a group, but she was like, but these are the dates that I have. Can I just go just me and you? And I was like, yeah, great. And I was offering two different trip packages at that time and she couldn't settle on one. So she just did both. So she traveled with me for about three and a half weeks and we got to do a lot of different things. We spent a lot of time talking about her divorce. We met a lot of really, really interesting people. They spent a a lot of time talking about her divorce. Um, and, and we had a really, really awesome time. And it was so cool over the course of that trip to watch her go from, you know, as soon as she would introduce herself, like she would, because she, you know, she had changed her name back. And so she would introduce herself and then it would kind of dawn on her that that wasn't her name anymore. And so then she would kind of explain the whole thing and like, and just go down this whole road about it. And by the end of the trip, like she wasn't this person who came to Africa because she got divorced. She was just this person who was in love with Africa. And so it was really cool to be able to watch that, that transition happen. And it was really cool to be able to run my first trip with somebody that I knew and with just one person, because there were some kinks to work out. Um, but that was a very manageable group size, you know, not being a group to be able to do that. Whereas then later when I had groups, I had kind of already been through it once and knew a bit more what to expect and, and whatnot. So are, are, yeah, she was my first. Are the um, so you said you live most of the time in South Africa, and then sometimes, and then you spend uh, a little bit of time in America. So you're kind of going back and forth. So do you own these horses in South Africa, or or how does this work? No. So we use different horses in every location we go. So if we go on safari, then the lodge where we stay on safari has horses that we'll be riding that are already used to seeing animals on safari and things like that. And then if we go fox hunting, we're riding horses who are used to jumping big fences and riding in a field full of horses kind of thing. So everywhere we go, we're riding horses that are already well versed in the activities we're doing. One of the questions I do get asked a lot, especially if I do, you know, like a booth at a trade show or at a horse show or something like that is people always come up to me and go, well, how do I bring my horse? And it always just makes me laugh because, you know, I don't know who would go to on vacation in South Africa and have it even occur to them to bring their horse, but I get asked this constantly. <laughs> People from America asking to bring their American horses. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we take that out of the equation, which definitely far simplifies things. Right. That's that's quite funny because I, is it, um, I know a lot of African countries, once you import a horse into those countries, they can never be exported again. Is that... Is that the same in South Africa? Yeah, and South Africa specifically has some, they have some pretty hectic diseases, like African horse sickness, which make it really, really, really difficult to move horses around, even inside South Africa to some extent. But exporting horses from South Africa is very difficult. So South Africa has, you know, a thriving horse culture and people riding at a very high level, just like in any other, you know, in the UK, in Australia, in the US. But you don't see those riders competing internationally because they can't get their horses out of South Africa. And so like the Olympic team for South Africa, they keep their horses in Europe and they train in Europe. Yeah. Because then they can compete internationally from there, but not from South Africa. Yes. Yeah. I know a lot of countries that are, is, are doing the same. Um, so, uh-huh. you know, what are the horses like in South Africa? I mean, you, you said a little bit they're very well trained, but but what are they like? Well, again, it's it's a very British culture. Um, especially within the riding community. And so you get, you know, you get a lot of horses off the track. Racing is really big. You get a lot of imported warm bloods from Europe and then people breeding from that. Um, so you do get a lot of those very, very similar. And then you have a couple of really unique um, 
really unique breeds and types of horses. For example, um, Namibian Warmbloods, which are wild horses in Namibia, which were German cavalry horses when Namibia was still German-occupied, which were then set free and released. And I'm not sure if it's the Namibian government or some sort of governing agency who runs these herds, but they... Um, they actually import stallions and really, really manage the herd so that even though they continue to be wild, they continue to be very, very well bred. Um, and then similar to the Mustangs in the U S they're rounded up every now and then, and people can adopt them. Um, and so you get a lot of horses coming into South Africa from there that are then trained, you know, for events who are these top level horses because they're these, you know, amazing athletic, tall, you know, everything people look for in a warm blood, except that they used to be wild, which is kind of unique, as opposed to, you know, like our Mustangs here, which people love the idea of adopting, but they just don't have the right body type for some of those higher level disciplines. Wow. Wow. I didn't know that. So about those, the... those bloods are kind of, kind of unique. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's very interesting. So they're, uh, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't have guessed a uh, wild herd of warm bloods <laughs> running around in a desert country. Right. (laughs) And they're, you know, they're very hardy because they live in the desert as opposed to, you know, you get a lot of warm bloods who've never, never had the opportunity to really learn how to be a horse and they hurt themselves at the drop of a hat. I don't know about you, but I've had a few of those. Wow. So I actually, I haven't uh, been to South Africa. So, you know, I'm very curious and interested from a, from a personal standpoint, but also, you know, for, yeah. for you, because you're living there. And I, I feel that this is an important topic to touch on, but like you said, a lot of people, uh, they see the news, they feel it's unsafe and they don't really know what the reality is, you know? So w- what's your experience as a, as a woman who lives there and, and travels there frequently, you know, what's the safety issues like, and, and is there any problems? Yeah, I mean, there is a very high crime rate. There's, you know, it's the wealth disparity is huge. And so you get a lot of people who have a lot and a lot of people who have nothing. And like anywhere else in the world where you see that, it does create some issues. Um, So robbery especially tends to be tends to be the big one where there's just, you know, the haves and the have nots. Um, but like many countries, you know, it's, it's not random. It's very, you follow certain rules and you take certain precautions and generally that then you're pretty safe, you know? So like, I don't drive at night. I stay out of certain neighborhoods. I always lock my doors, even when I'm driving, you know, through my neighborhood, things like that. Um, and for the most part, the touristy areas are pretty safe. Um, you know, the big cities, the crime tends to be a lot more concentrated in certain areas um and so that does make it a lot easier to to manage in terms of just staying to places that you know you're going to be safe or you know that you're minimizing your your risk and have you but it is nice to be able to turn things over to somebody else and not have to worry about those details yourself you know yeah and and have you experienced any kind of uh, close calls or you know how, how have you managed it um, I did get robbed while driving. The first year I was actually living in South Africa. I just moved to Johannesburg, and and I was actually moving from one house to another. So I had all my stuff with me. I had my suitcase in the back. I had my riding helmet in a bag on my passenger seat and my purse under my passenger seat. And was slowing down, approaching a red light, because I knew I was going to run the red light, because you don't stop at red lights at night in Johannesburg. And, um, and just, just slowed down a little bit. And it was and this guy ran up and broke my window and was gone before I even thought about it. And I looked over and was like, Oh, well, he just got my riding helmet. Like, that's okay. <laughs> and then I reached under the seat and realized that he had grabbed that bag too. And oh, it had wow. my laptop, my camera, my passport, um, all of the, the gate keys to all of my riding clients houses. I mean, you know, everything important. And, um, so that was really scary and kind of a big bummer but at the same time it was like you know everything on my laptop was backed up and um but then a couple days later I got a call from actually from the husband of the woman that I had first volunteered for when I had first gone to South Africa saying you know someone has your driver's license and like what are you okay what happened what is going on and somebody had found a bunch of so whoever took my stuff had discarded the stuff they didn't want and somebody else had found it and I had a 
notebook with all of my details from my different trips with clients. And so he'd gone through this notebook calling these different hotels and whatnot until he came across someone who knew my name. And it was the owner of a guest house that I had been put in touch with through this this couple I knew. And so when he called them, that guy was like, oh, yeah, she's, you know, she's friends with Cornelia and managed to get in touch with me. And so I went and met up with this guy. And basically the guy had, who had robbed me kept my laptop, cash and camera and discarded everything else. And then somebody found it and went to great lengths to make sure I got it back. And when I originally got the message, I thought he just had my notebook and my driver's license. And so I was like, well, that's a pity, you know, it's not worth much, but I do need my driver's license, obviously, to be able to rent cars and stuff. And then I went and met up with him and he had, I mean, my passport, my keys, all my credit cards, my glasses, oh. my driver's license, all the things that would have been especially difficult to replace he had and my riding helmet, which had actually been a gift from my mom. It's a model that's not continued. I'm super picky about my helmets. <laughs> so I was really happy to get that back. I did drop it on the concrete like a week later, but wow. So, so do so, you, yeah, and so within the same, and there is a, there is kind of a bad area that I had been driving near, but within that same community, I mean, the person who robbed me presumably came out of that community, but the person who found my stuff and worked really hard to make sure it got back to me also lived in that community. So do you have any advice or tips for somebody interested in traveling to South Africa? Yeah, I think definitely kind of knowing your way around the city or even hiring a driver in the major cities can be really nice because there are little things like that where sometimes you have just these little pockets of crime, these crime hotspots that that you don't know about unless you've been there. Um, but otherwise, I mean, sticking to, sticking to major touristy areas, you know, tourism is bringing a huge amount of money into South Africa right now. And so everybody is working really hard to make sure that that continues to happen. And so a lot of work is being done to keep the touristy areas safe. Um, but then a lot of the same rules that apply in a lot of other other countries. You know, you don't walk around the street flashing your fancy iPhone or your big camera or wearing a lot of jewelry. You know, you just you try not to make yourself a target and you try to keep yourself in safe areas and just take the precautions that you can and don't worry about the parts you can't control. And what about uh, some of the places that you're riding with the horses? Are they very rural places or are they very far from the from the towns or what's that like it's a bit of both um so our fox hunting is the only activity we do in johannesburg and that's in a suburb um that's very very horsey kailami actually has the highest concentration of horses per capita in the world and that's where the rand hunt is based and so you know kailami is a lot safer than say central joburg but when we're in kailami doing the fox hunt then we can also go and do some cool activities in the city but we don't stay in the city um and then in cape town we ride in the winelands and we ride on the beach and those are both fairly close to the city um and so we do spend a lot of time touring around the city and then other than that you know the safaris and riding on the beaches and things like that are all going to be a lot more rural and so do you have a, I don't know, a special uh, memory or a story of something, maybe you were riding along and, you know, whatever the experience was, and you just had that moment of like, wow, this this is why I'm here. Um, every day. Um, no, just kidding. But um, yeah, there's definitely been a couple. I remember one, that first year I was in South Africa, and we were on that farm, and we went on a camping trip. We had some clients who came and were doing a a several week long um, kind of natural horsemanship internship. This couple from Joburg, actually, um, they were the ones that I later went and visited in, in Joburg and then ended up meeting people in Joburg and moving my, my base of operations to Joburg when I came back later. But that first camping trip, so we're camping in this, this gorge on this farm and just sleeping out. We had a big stretch tent, open sided, sleeping out under the stars. The horses are kind of just roaming around us. They're not fenced in. And my friend's horses are very, they're very herd bound. And so, you know, they're happy to leave the herd if you're riding, but a lot of times the ones that aren't being ridden just, just come with you also. And so like we had packed in and we were each riding horses and then had, you know, our pack horses are not, not on leads or anything. And they just come with, and there's a full moon that night. And so the, the other volunteer, the German girl and I wanted to go for a full moon ride and we couldn't get anybody else to, to, wake up in the middle of the night and come with us. But um, we went out to the horses and she, she had a halter on hers and hers is kind of one of the more dominant 
horses of the herd. And then I got on this little mare who's just, who's just lovely. I can get on with no, no saddle, no bridle, nothing and ride the way I rode when I was a little kid, you know, and just be able to completely trust that horse in a way that, that I, as an adult, I really, really don't with most horses, you know? Um, and it's pitch black in the Canyon. And so we get on these horses and we start riding and we're riding up the road out of this gorge and you can hear the other horses around us, all these hoofbeats, but you can't actually really see them. And we start going faster and faster and you can hear the pounding hoofbeats echoing off the the sides of this gorge around us. Um, And then we get to the top and we burst out and there's just all of these stars and the big full moon and the whole herd had come with us. So we've got like 10, 12 horses running around us and um, yeah. And that was just, just magical. Wow. And um, what what about the the safaris that you that you ride on? I I can imagine that that's something very surreal as well. Yeah, that is really cool as well because I mean you you can get pretty close to animals on safari in a vehicle. A lot of these animals are so used to seeing people in vehicles that it doesn't even phase them anymore. But you're still in this vehicle. Um, you know, looking out at something, whereas on the horse, you know, you're, you're in it. And so many of these animals don't see the horses as a threat the way they do the vehicles. And so, you know, like rhinos, for example, are kind of like, well, I'm standing here eating grass and you're staying there eating grass. So let's just stand here and eat grass together. And you'll just be standing right next to something. And as long as, you know, your horse is grazing, they're grazing, everybody's happy. And so you can can get really, really close to a lot of those animals that are a bit more shy when it comes to the vehicles. Obviously, with some of the more dangerous animals, you do have to take take some precautions. You know, we're not trying to get super close to things like lions. But, um, yeah, it's definitely a very different feel than being able to go and just be in a Jeep. So I'm just going to ask, maybe everyone else is thinking it, um, what happens if you see a lion... And you fall off. <laughs> there is actually a video online somewhere a couple years ago where I'm trying to remember so that I don't get this wrong. <laughs> a couple was on safari, not with me. They were somewhere in Botswana and they were cantering and kind of saw some lions, but kept cantering. And then one of them fell off and they both had GoPros on. And so the video shows the footage kind of from both. And this lion like came up to, I think it was the wife that fell off and the lion like comes up to her, but then wanders off. Um, I mean, a lot of the safaris that do big five safaris. So big five are the, the five most dangerous animals to, to hunt on foot, I think is what that classification comes from. But, um, but that those have become like the big ones that people try to see when they go on safari. And so those are elephants, rhinos, lions, leopards, and buffalo. Um, and a lot of operators that do big five safaris, I mean, you have to be able to ride. And a lot of times they'll, they'll make sure of that before they take you out there. And then there are some safaris, and I, I, I do offer some of these as well, where we're riding with non-dangerous game, but then you can go on a Jeep safari and see some of the more dangerous game. So if we have people who aren't very confident riders, we're not going to take them out riding with lions. Um, but to get back to your question, I mean, mostly, you know, you really try not to fall <laughs> off. But we try to just be really observant of the animal's behavior and the body signals that they're giving. All the guards, all of the... The mounted safari um, guard uh, guides are always armed. Um, and so, you know, they try really hard to make sure that nobody's going to get into any of those situations. But lions especially, you know, they tend to hunt at night, not during the day. They have to be either really hungry or really, really upset with you um, to get aggressive towards a big group of riders during the day. Um, and so as long as you stay with your group, you tend not to be in a situation where a lion is going to see you as a lunchable option. Um, and do they have any and, like advice for, you know, if worst case scenario, you fell off, do you stand your ground or do you wait for the guy yep. to come back with his gun? Do, or Yeah. Whatever you do, don't run. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I mean, ideally don't fall off. That's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And generally, you know, when you are near animals like that, you're not going to go cantering past, you know, you're going to walk past and try not to incite any kind of chase or anything like that. Um, 
So, you know, in theory, you're not doing the kinds of things that would make you fall off in the first place. But. Okay. So, so fast getaways aren't necessary. No. That's good. That's good to know. Um, though I'm sure it's thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what, as a, um, what, what's your recommendations of somebody wanting to come to South Africa? Like, what are your special, like, must-see things or things to experience that, like, you have to come to South Africa to experience it? Um, riding on safari is definitely one of them because that is just amazing. Um, and then Cape Town and the Winelands are are just a really cool place to see and travel. The Winelands are absolutely spectacular, and there's so many cool places you can ride to. Um, there are a couple different options there where people can do wine tasting on horseback or even do multi-day riding from winery to winery on horseback. And um, and then you can also go and you know see Cape Town and hike in the mountains there and see the penguins and all of the cool things that Cape Town is known for. Um, so yeah, Cape Town, the Winelands, and, and the safaris are definitely kind of my my top three you you know you can ride on beautiful beaches in a lot of places in the world and you can do that in South Africa too but um you know they're they're not necessarily all that different than than any other beaches in a lot of other places um but the safari and the winelands and Cape Town are really truly spectacular and I know South Africa is is quite big um and you know I don't I don't quite know geographically where everything is but you said you know there's mountains and there's the beach and there's lots of stuff so you know is everything that you're sort of mentioning generally around cape town area or are are there different special places uh, so south africa is about half the size of the continental u.s maybe a little bigger um so it's a huge country and so you do have a lot that's around South Africa. And then to go on safari, you would probably fly. So South Af- or, uh, around Cape Town, rather. And then to go on safari, you would fly. Um, so Cape Town is in the southwest corner of the country. And Kruger National Park is in the northeast. And just to give you an idea, Kruger, the park itself, is bigger than the UK. Um, I mean, it is, it's huge. And... So there's a lot of there are a lot of lodges and safaris within the park, and then private reserves outside the park, which are actually a bit nicer because then you're not sharing it with a bunch of other self-driving tourists. And so the riding safaris tend to be in more of those private um, private reserves. But that is a you know it's a two or three hour flight from Cape Town to get there, um, and then a lot of the beaches are along the coast between Durban and Cape Town, and so that is a really nice route to drive if you have that option. Um, but it's, you know, it's far, so you have to budget the time accordingly. So a lot of, like, I, I mostly deal with American clients and they, they tend not to have that much vacation time. And so they go to somewhere like South Africa and try to fit as much into two weeks as they can. And so we tend to fly from location to location rather than drive just, just from a time budget standpoint. And, you know, so you're traveling back and forth from America to South Africa. Are you always just working in South Africa or are you traveling around to other destinations for fun in the meantime or? Yeah, a bit of both. Um, I mean, again, I do a lot outside of horses as well. And so when I'm in South Africa, I also, I teach yoga, I teach rock climbing. I do a lot of that. I go back to this friend's farm every year to volunteer um, and things of that nature. And so, you know, my trips aren't always back to back to back. And so I get to squeeze in a lot in between, and then I'm always exploring new new destinations. So last year I got to go to Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, and did a little bit of riding there to try to build some trips. Um, we're putting together some safaris in, in Kenya and Tanzania as well. Um, so I try to r- travel as much around Africa as I can while I'm there um, in an effort to build some new destinations nations, but also just get to see some new places and do some different things. Namibia is somewhere that I haven't been yet and really would like to go ride. Um, And then even within South Africa, it's such a massive country and there's still so much I haven't seen or places that I'll pass through and really want to go back and spend more time. And so getting to spend as much time in the country as I do gives me a lot of options um, to go out and do a lot of exploring, both on and off horses. So apart from South Africa, do you have any other like favorite uh, countries or places that you, you just love so much? Um, Mozambique was one I went to this past year that I just 
it just took my breath away. I mean, I have never, ever seen water so blue. You just get mesmerized by it. Um, and the people we stayed with there were phenomenal. The rides we went on were just to die for. The food was just incredible. Um, Mozambique is definitely very, very high on my list of favorites. Um, and just something that, you know, I wouldn't have gone to Mozambique from the U S but going from South Africa, it was really accessible and, and we just had such an incredible time. And do you have any advice for, I don't know, maybe there's other ladies interested in starting a horse riding tourism business or interested in traveling around? Do you have any advice for others that might be interested in doing something similar to what you've done? Um, probably not, because a lot of it I'm still trying to figure out. I'm really <laughs> just making this up as a Um I think for me, putting together the trips is the easy part, but connecting with people is the hard part. And so, you know, it took several years to really build my brand and get my name out there. And that's still something that I'm trying to do more of. Um, and a lot of it is just, you know, just word of mouth and being patient. And um, yeah, I think doing things like this and just connecting with like-minded people and people who are passionate about riding and travel is is the best possible way to, to start and to branch out in as, as many directions as you can. And do you find, because, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, growing up in a small town in California, I think uh, I reached the stage where, you know, I was traveling so much that people just stopped uh, being impressed by what I'm doing, and they even stopped, you know, being that interested. Um, but, you know, do you have a lot of Americans that are like, oh, my God, I need to come with you, this sounds amazing, or do you have a lot of, like, skepticism, like, no, that sounds a little bit sketchy, or, you know, what, what's the attitude? I get a lot of, that sounds really cool, and I really, really want to do it, but next year. Right. Yeah. So I get a lot of interest, but not a lot of commitment. Mm. And so bridging the gap between people wanting to do it and people being like, okay, I'm fully confident enough in this that I'm going to take the leap and we're going to do this is, is tricky. And what would you say the biggest thing, because I do think that is something culturally about America and we're very quick to come up with excuses sometimes. I mean, of course, not all of us, not the people listening to this podcast, cause we're all adventurous, <laughs> yeah. but you know, a, a lot of Americans, you know, they, like you said, Oh my God, that sounds really cool. I would so love to do that. And then you never hear from them again. So what, what is it about? Do you yeah. think that we're sort of blocking ourselves from, from doing that? I think a lot of Americans dream big but live small, um, where you know they have this list of places they want to visit or this list of things they want to do, and dreaming about it is enough. And then I think people who've gone and done these things, you know, the dreaming is never enough. You're always trying to do more, see more, travel more, visit more places, meet more people, do more things. Um, but I think for a lot of people if they haven't done it and they don't know what they're missing, then just dreaming about it is enough to sustain that. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. And, and I would agree with that. You know, they, they don't know what they're missing out on. Dreamers than doers. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And especially because in America, you know, we have, everything is HD and surround sound and, you know, you feel like you're actually there, but you're not, (laughs) you're not there. (laughs) It's totally different than watching it on, you know, TV or at the cinema. I mean, it's totally, totally different, but you don't know what you don't know. But it's, I mean, a lot more, you know, Europeans especially who go, you know, I mean, a lot more Europeans who will, for example, book, book a riding safari by themselves to go to a foreign country and just do that and just go for it. Whereas so many more Americans are like, you know, I want someone to go with me or what if I'm overfaced or what Mm. if, what if, what if, what if. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So what would you say to them? That they just need to go for it. I mean, you get there and you figure it out, you know, you meet amazing people. And so there's nowhere that you travel alone that you'll end up really actually being alone. And, you know, all of these places, places that offer these riding riding vacations are used to dealing with people who come from a lot of different riding disciplines and a lot of different riding levels you know they will make sure that you're on an appropriate horse and that you're riding at a pace that's suitable for you um i think a lot of people make the assumption that when i go do these things that i'm riding these like really really big horses on these really tough rides and we're always going really fast and i'm always by myself and everything is dangerous and that's and that's just not the reality um, 
you know, there's, there's something out there for everybody. And, and so that's what I'm trying to do is help some of those people who aren't as confident, um, or aren't as brave to find, not to find that confidence, but to find something that suits the level that they're at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it's very, um, healing, you know, like you mentioned with that lady who was, she was the divorced lady, but then by the end of the trip, she was just kind of a lady just living life. And yeah, absolutely. And I've had a lot of writers like that who you know come on a trip with me because they're not confident enough to do it by themselves but then they go back and they return home a much more confident writer you know especially people who you know take a weekly lesson on a very well-schooled horse and are able to do a lot but on that horse and so to then go and get to ride a lot of other horses and do things they never thought they were going to do then they come home and they're ready to do so much more because they know that they can Exactly. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, it's funny, like you mentioned earlier, the, the Americans that want to bring their own horse to that country. And, you know, yeah. there's so many times where I was riding out on trails um, on the local horses, of course, with a group. And, you know, how many times did I hear somebody commenting like, oh, my, my horse back home would never do this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that how how many times have I heard this? And, you know, you don't have to do it on your horse necessarily. You know, it's so much fun to go and, and ride the local horses that know the land and know their job. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Well, um, thank you very much for, for joining me today. I, I hate that I have to kind of wrap up, um, but um, I'm, I really appreciate you, you yeah. sharing this advice and, and stories. Yeah, well, it was great to chat with you as well. And do you want to go ahead and mention one last time? So where can people find you or follow you or, or come riding with you? So my website is www.equiscapes.com. That's E-Q-U-E-S-C-A-P-E-S. And you can also follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Equiscapes. I also have a blog um, called The Epic Equestrian and a Facebook group called Epic Equ- Equiscapes Epic Equestrians. Bit of a tongue tongue tie there um and we offer trips in a lot of really cool different places so come and check it out the next one we're doing is in utah at the end of october we're going to antelope island to round up buffalo on horseback which should be quite interesting um so if that's an adventure you're interested in participating in let me know and then i'll be heading back to south africa in november and running trips in south africa from about november to next may such a boring life you live really um, <laughs> it's really tough. <laughs> yeah. It must, it sounds, oh, yeah, awful. <laughs> so thank you again. And we will have to keep in touch. I'll keep following along on your adventures and, um, yeah, so, I will include all of your links in our show notes so people can just come and find us on equestrian adventuresses on our podcast channel. So wonderful. You have been listening to the equestrian adventuresses podcast. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website, equestrianadventuresses.com, for links to the show notes. Leave us a review and consider becoming a premium member for bonus episodes and footage. More information can be found on our website. Until next time, adventuresses, happy trails. Happy trails.